Let's see. So, dear colleagues, welcome to the Heliophys and Spatial Physics Seminars promoted by the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research and the Galileo Solar Space Telescope Working Group. In particular, this seminar is hosted by the Space Geophysics Graduate Program and by the Research in Heliophysics Project, sponsored by CAPS, a Brazilian funding agency. Today, our guest is Dr. Andrea Chicala from North Umbria University in Miralis Data, both from UK. He studied physics at the Brazilian Federal University of Lavras, concluding in 2015. During this period, he spent a year as an exchange student at the University of Lundi. Uh, this program was sponsored by the Brazilian government. After he got a master's degree in spatial physics here at the INPI, the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research. And recently, recently Andre concluded his PhD program at the Northumbria University, sponsored by the university itself. His research focuses on solar physics with emphasis on solar magnetic field. During his PhD, he compiled a large the database of sunspot energy injection employing a space based uh, observations. On behalf of INC, I would like to thank Dr. Shikrala for accepting our invitation to present the seminar on point in flux in active regions, which is, of course, a topic of central interest for our research activities at INC. We ask the audience to mute their microphones during the presentation. You can ask questions at the end, or if you prefer, you can write down at the chat. So, Andre, go ahead and take your time. Sure. So, first, I uh, would like to thank for, for this moment. I mean, it's always, I had a very, very, very fond memories of the National Institute for Space Research in Brazil. It hosts many people that taught me a lot. And it's always good, even for a tiny bit, to give it back and help too in the efforts. And I'm going to be sharing with all of you the main find is that I use it to write my thesis. And I hope you all enjoy it, at least a bit as much as I enjoy actually making it. And well, as Louis said himself, and he, he had quite some information on me. I've, maybe he had the backup of the CAPS database on the last <laughs> CVs. But I was investigating the magnetic energy injection active regions uh, using the point in flux. And to give a quick introduction, and I suppose everyone can see my screen, can, if you can see this Google browser here, when we look at the sun, if we look today, for example, over its many lenses, we can see those magnetic structures. And uh, we can see them kind of directly because of the plasma that stay trapped there. But today is not a very good day to talk but to show active regions because they're, they're not a very evident one except by this small spot here. But they can be very large in size, size and even walking groups as we can see, for example, in this large sunspot group that produced quite a lot of activity. And by activity, I mainly refer to flares, which is a bright release of energy, or CMAs, whereas coronal mass ejections that they eject mass. And the central point here is these high energetic activities that are produced in the active regions, how can we better understand how the energy buildup took place. And some people use the data from the HMI to extrapolate and recreate that field above and measure the energy. But we opted to do that with the pointing flux. And oops. Now, with the object of what? Compare the contributions of the different kinds of pointing flux. One is by emergency, emergency motions, another by horizontal motions, and check 
if there is a preferential type of energy injection that can be profiled, depending on the morphology of the active regions, what is morphology? If you look at its, its magnetic field in the continuum, the structure, they can be profiled according to how it looks like. For example, it's just one, one a nipple or spot. <laughs> of course, the lines are going to be connecting the overlying plage or something like that. There is no such thing as a multiple. Uh, or are they a bipole? Or are they more, how are those polarities mixed? And based on that, we can, there, there are classifications to include these active regions in. And also to explore if there are any time scales and levels of energy injection for these act for active regions that produce the flares. In this work, I'm going to look, as I just stated here in the third objective, I'm going to look at flares. I am not particularly interested in CMEs, although there was a plan to later on expand the work for this and also mine the database, the databases that have this information. And how do we do that? I mean, these are, this is the main equation of this work here. And all it tells us is that we have the point influx going over a surface. And to know that, we need the magnetic field and the velocity. Well, that's a very good thing nowadays because we have the ATMI that is, has been taken with an unprecedented precision and also cadence, with images of the, the sol, uh, measurements of the magnetic field in the, in the solar atmosphere. And based on those images of the magnetic field, people like P. Chuck and Brian Welsh, they published just by the early 2000s, some algorithms that could take the changes in the magnetic field and infer the velocity that those structures were moving. So we have a lot of data that we can work on at this time. The ATMI just recently crossed the point that it observed a full solar cycle. So we have just over a thousand, reaching 2000 now, I assume, different active regions. And when we work on this equation here, feeding back on what I say, we can split it in, into two components that are due to emergency and shearing. What does that mean? Vertical and horizontal motions. And <clears throat> another thing here, there is a perpendicular here. If you go have a look on the, on the paper published by Demulan in 2003, he is going to be show that motions that are parallel to the magnetic field, they will not contribute to energy injection. And if you use that to calculate on, on the numbers, you're gonna have some prob problems if you try to calculate them using these expressions to separate the fields. Because in here, the very nature of the cross product will take that out for you. But if you try to use the dot product and feeding in the, the velocity without filtering, that's going to lead you to an error. So like I was saying, the, there was quite a lot of time that we were having observations yet. When I was preparing the data to do my work, it was just in by the end of 2018, if I remember right, we had around six years of observation. That is roughly half a solar cycle. So we wanted to try to draw conclusions that would be more general, try to, to see the bigger picture of it. And to do so, we decided to have a look on the Mont Wilson classes, which is an, ex, an ex, a classification of the morphology of the active region, how it looks like on the continuum. And it's daily reported by NOAA. And looking at the incidence of these regions at every day along this time, they follow this distribu uh, distribution that's very similar to this. So there is a vast majority of alphas and betas that are simple monopoles and bipoles, monopoles. Some there are beta deltas, so they are a bipole with a tiny delta spot, which is a spot of opposite polarity inside the, the polarity that it's opposite with. A beta gamma, which is 
a bipole with a mixed polarity around it. You cannot really clearly see a distinction between the polarities. And a beta gamma delta, that sums the complexity of these two, basically, because you have two polarities that are mixed and you have a delta spot. And then we pick the sample that mimicked that to, to do our, our database. In the end, we ended up with 122 different active regions, which was by the time roughly 10% of what was observed. And it follows a very similar distribution to this, except that we on purpose added a bit more of the most complex cases, because if you do it strictly pro pro proportional, you would have only a few of those. In the case of the beta deltas, maybe less than one. So you wouldn't have anything at all to, to compare to. Uh, you can ask yourself, well, you could have processed every single region that appeared. No, there's no time for that because even though I automated all the processing for this data, it still takes a considerable amount of time to process it. Every region to download and process everything could take a couple hours. So that builds up along the time and also the work that was done to make all these codes automate, as automated as possible. And mind yourself that these codes are available on my GitHub. If you want to download, I ported the original code from IDL to Python. So everyone can go there and use for free and reproduce these results. And yes, so that, that consumed a chunk of time. And we use the sample that is, should give us pretty accurate results. And first, we were looking at what happens in the maps at pixel level. So we picked a set of five regions that didn't produce a flare. And now, what do you mean by didn't produce any flares? There wasn't any recordings of it in the database that maintained this activity. So when I say that a region didn't flare, that's what I mean. Because in some in solar maxima, for example, sometimes the background radiation is, is already edging it what a sea level flare would produce. So even if the region produced a B class flare, you wouldn't you wouldn't have a register for it. And but you will see in some studies that class that are below C anyway, they are mostly disregarded. But those regions, they are picked uh, space along the, the no flare regions along the solar cycle. And we, we did these calculations for all of its of their lifetimes. So these regions didn't produce even a B flare as far as <laughs> we could measure. And then we pick a three different active regions, which is NOAA 11593. 12644, and the one that I don't get tired of studying 12443. This region is a very small region with like only a 10 million, million, I don't know how to say the name of, now, of the solar surface. And <laughs> there is this one that was an emergent region and produced an M class flare. This one only produced one single C class flare. This produced a couple C class flares and one M class flare. And this produced a series of B, C's class flares and a large N class flare. So the blue bars here are a frequency distribution for total point in flux in most unfortunately ergs per centimeter squared per second. So the energy that's coming for, all, for every pixel and making a histogram of it over its lifetime. So what we're hoping to accomplish here is use the blue, the regions that didn't flare as a baseline, and then see the difference of the regions that, uh, against the regions that produced flares of different kind, as was explained, different intensity, maybe better. So interesting bit here, the region that didn't flare, that, that only produced the smallest C-class flare, actually was seen a smaller energy injection than the regions that didn't produce flares at all. Also injection, and on here you can notice the negative numbers, remove. 
Now, if we compare to the region that's in between, we can already see a difference in the edges here. So in the wings of this histogram. So they actually had more pixels that were, were presenting as a larger energy injection. And this difference is even more pronounced on the most extreme case we had here. But still, notice that this difference here is gonna be appearing roughly less than 10% of all the pixels. So this energy injection in the field of view, in the whole field of view of the region is very local. And probably it is something that people should later look on, look in more detail, but using a higher spatial resolution. Because here, as I said, we look at the whole lifetime, all the data that is provided, but the works that generally look at localized phenomena like this, they are gonna see what happened in a couple hours in between the event. So you might be missing some, some information as I'm gonna bring a bit more evidence on this, for example, in the next plot, because in here we did the time series of these regions. So then the red lines are the flaring regions. So here we have the normal tangential and total energy that was injected at every point in time as it was going around the sun. So here we have by heliographic longitude. And then we're like, ah, but strange. Technically we could go to minus 19 plus 19. Mm, not really. If you go too close to the edges, what you're going to notice is there, if you are looking at the images, you might see an structure of one polarity in one image. And then the image is following it, that polarity changed or had such an abrupt change that may not make much sense. And that is a common problem when you're measuring something close to the limb, which is a disambiguation effect because the, the calculation of the magnetic field has two solutions that are ambiguous between themselves, could go either way. And while in the center, the algorithms are quite precise and to determine that's not quite true in the limb. So that shift, since the algorithms that derive velocity from the magnetic field, they are relying on sequence of images, they are just gonna find inconsistent solutions if they see a shift like this, because they don't make sense, for example, when compared to the induction image. So they are very right in saying that the solution doesn't exist. But yes, so generally, and I tell you that from processing quite a few of them, this, you're gonna start seeing day for vm being capable of producing the results at minus 70 after plus 70 at best. But notice here that I actually cropped even, even more than that. And I added those, those black lines. And why is that? The black lines represent where I start actually trusting the data. Because if you, see, if you actually visually inspect the data after that over many regions, you're gonna notice that this is where it's already fairly stable. Like you are gonna see, it's unlikely you see disambiguation, significant disambiguation effects after this point. So this, also the heliographic longitude is measured based on the centroid of the active region. What's that? You have the image space, that's the center of the image space. Like you have the picture, center of the picture, basically. Okay, so dashed lines on different colors, they are the non-flaring regions, red lines, the flaring regions. Red vertical dashed lines, they are M-class flares, and the orange lines in the top, they are C-class flares. So it, we can see how active, for example, this region was in relation to the other two. First, notice how the smallest region in the set was actually showing energy levels that is only comparable to the smallest region in the non-flaring set. So at no point it had an energy injection that was larger than the non-flaring set. We cannot see a particular, a massive change before the flare or, we, or, the, or 
that it was just stable. There is not much to say then in here. This region 12644 is quite an interesting case because in here was when the bipolar structure was just emerging on the disk. So this region is, it would make an exceptional case study in my opinion, because you can track it from its full emergence to the production of M-class flare. Again, yes, we can see the black, no, the, the black line here that denotes where I mistrust the data a bit more, but still we work with what we have. And it's rare to find these occurrences. M-class flares, X-class flares, they are very rare. And finding an emergent region that do, that's quite a finding. And here we see two interesting things. We see initial surge, and that, if you look at the images, can be mapped back to the emergence of the structure. So yes, if the structure is emerging, there is a large velocity and a lot of new field entering there. So if you think, well, the equations only depend on the velocities and field, it's, it should be, it should lead to a, a, higher, a higher energy reading. It makes complete sense. After that big emergency gets down to the same level of the non flaring regions, and then here, there is something that's very tricky that happens. There is a large surge, especially in the tangential component. And then the region produces that massive flare. And then there is no more data after that. And we see somewhat of a similar behavior in here, but in a different time scale in the largest region. This region was always an order of magnitude higher in energy than the no flaring ones. It is also significantly larger in area. So before the flare, we can see a change in the behavior or of the tangential component that was removing energy here. And then it builds up, it has quite an inflection. And then after the flare, it gets stable again. While the normal component was basically just stable, had the dip with the tangential energy. And then after the flare, it started going down again after some time. But the time scales involved here are spread, are spread among many days. While in here, this was basically one day of emergence, which is quite rapid. And spoiler alert, on the days we also have a graphic that we actually took those results over a larger sample because we were like, well, could we observe this? this surge in energy in a larger sample. And by larger, I mean 10, because that was what we end up with, uh, 10 regions that we could see the energy build up all over its whole lifetime. And it was closer to the center. We even in a larger database, we are left with not many entries. And actually the behavior that they show was quite diverse. So this, those, we couldn't see this sort of behavior being reproducing, uh, being reproduced over a larger set. So there seems to be a lack of general trend here, which is not really a surprise because many researchers uh, in the early 2000s, again, and before that, they were already showing that a flare, a CMA, those energetic events mapping their cause is not a trivial problem. And there doesn't seem to be a unique parameter that it's going to tell you, oh, this is going to happen. Otherwise, I think most of us wouldn't even have a, have a job in the first case. <laughs> but thanks to the complexity of the problems, a lot of for sure will have that. So we can study the space. Right. Let me see if there was anything I left unsaid. I don't think so. Hmm. All right. Again. Then we move it to the sample study in the whole set of regions that we have. So then again, from the 122 different NOAA numbered active regions, we decided to actually cut our sample size again based on the following premise. If I want to study the behavior of every region and the flare it's produced, if I have sometimes when you are making the harps, which is in a very simplistic way of saying, a squared cut that follows an active region over its lifetime, over its transit, you're gonna see a group of active regions being 
moving together because sometimes they they and more often they appear in groups and you cannot just separate them from each other to, to produce the harp at least make a squared harp and then it could be very tricky to pinpoint which region is contributing to the the activity so we decided to work with regions that had only one active region in the harp and that left us with 52 regions if i remember and then we decided to look based on their maximum complexity that they showed over the lifetime what do i mean by that Every day, Sweepsy is going to tell you there are these active regions in the sun. Sweepsy is going to tell you this region is an alpha or a beta or a beta gum. Is going to issue a classification for it? As many other parameters that they do, they do an extraordinary service, I must say. The people that provide us with data, they spoil us. But, right. What's very interesting, what I find very interesting. This is a box and whisker plot. So this shows uh, the distribution of total accumulated energy and the share of this total accumulated energy that is produced by emergence in blue and shearing in orange. The sum of them is depicted in green. So the bottom plot is the share that these two present from the green one, that emergence and tangential represent from the green one. And they are separated based, again, on the maximum to Wilson class. So if you look at all the days, you pick the maximum complex it had, and that is, gonna, is, is how it's going to be labeled. And we also look at that into different time resolutions, just spoiling it. There is a small, the red lines, the, the red horizontal lines, they are denoting zero in here. So it's net zero energy because sometimes they could go negative too. And they do. But in, in here, it's a 50% line, which would show uh, that the contribution from the two components is the same. No, it shows that, don't need quotes. One thing, there are very few beta gammas regions, they amount the regions that contributed to maximum to some class to two. So I actually consider this only a small illustration, but two is not even uh, an, an enough number to actually create a box and whisker plots unless you force it. So I want everyone to look at these here with sexism. I mean, it, it could be anything in between the alphas and the, the alpha beta and the beta delta gums as far as we know. So just to be completely clear here. Oh, well, what we can see here is that as we evolve in complexity, the amount of energy they are normally going to see seems to be increasing, judging by the, the middle, the middle bar in the box of whisker plot that denotes the mean energy of this set. But if we see how this distribution extends, we will also observe that some alpha regions, they are gonna be producing more energy than some beta regions. We can even see the case here where the distribution, the mean of this distribution is actually higher than the betas. The beta deltas and beta gammas, they are gonna be higher up on this. Very rarely, we are going to see something that goes below the zero line. And that is only on the whiskers, those bars that denote only a few percent of the regions. And the outliers also show that some beta regions, they can produce even more than some of the beta gamma deltas. So although we have this progression, Active regions don't seem at first glance to follow a rigid rule, but they do seem to see more energy injection in general as their complexity goes up. 
now, if we look at the preferred mechanism of this energy injection, emergency is generally quite clearly preferred in all the cases, except by this tiny edge here on the beta regions, we see that over 50% of the energy is being injected by emergency. And that is very clear on the beta, beta gammas and beta gamma deltas. Again, this tells us the same story, but the sample size is too small. So don't take that too seriously. And there are also extreme cases like that 80% of the region, for example, was introduced the emergency or even that only about 30% was. But generally we see this preference. And this box represent over 90% of the data already, with the outliers being just the 1% that don't fit. Cool. Now, we could also track how these energy profiles, depending on how the regions evolve. Like I said before, SWIPSI is gonna tell you, oh, this region was an alpha today, this region was a beta today. So you can know, oh, this region, evolved upwards in its classification, or it decayed. You see that happening all the time. Sometimes the regions decay in pliers. Sometimes the regions decay, well, they don't decay more than pliers, but they evolve and devolve in this classification. So here we have four cases that they start as an alpha, beta, beta, gamma, and beta, gamma, delta. Again, beta deltas are not here because they were just so small that we couldn't make a reliable statistics of it. So we don't have a, an idea of the number of images we are talking about here. All the products in the database, they amount for close to a million different images that we are extracting this, although uh, about one, a fraction of them, if I recall correctly, is one ninth or 10% of it, let's say, they are images of total pointing flux. Another 10% is images of, because we have different products on those images. Still, so we still have at this 12 minutes resolution, a very large number of images. But here we were compiling what was accumulated over a 20 hours period from its classification. So what we can see here is that as regions are, and this is the same type of graphic just reiterating that we saw on this slide here, but we are collapsing then into smaller ones. So we can observe, com observe and compare these into the side by side. Right. So mostly the regions that are evolving upwards they are seeing more energy injection than the regions that stayed with their classification or devolved, as we can see in the betas that turn into alphas or the betas that turn into beta gums. And we can notice also that they have a preference in emergence as the mechanism for energy injection. Yes, there is an exception here. The region, the alpha regions that stayed alphas, they were actually seen to be injection, having more energy injection than the regions that evolved to beat. And on the other hand, this is quite clear in the regions that were beta gammas and actually showed up with a delta spot on that after that. They were seeing remarkably higher levels of energy, like this is on the 10 to the 33, while all of those are 10 to the 32. So the scale here involved on those regions that reach the maximum classification is, is quite large, which again, may make us think, oh, but then it might be just the size or the classification of it. That's something that has been said over works before. And it would be, Simplistic to say so, but that surely is showing to contribute a bit. And also we are gonna see that the regions that kept their classification, 
or devo or devolved, they were seeing most of their energy again, with an exception in here in the alphas that stayed alpha, of energy being injected by via tangential motions. While that was quite clearly pronounced in the regions that evolved upwards, and even in some of the cases, like the beta gammas that say beta gammas, that maintain their classification. So again, we are seeing a distinction in how energy, how active regions are gathering their energy based on the plasma motions. And again, this we are talking about the whole lifetime, cutting again from where the centroid of the regions are judged to be free of this ambiguation. So we have many days of data showing us that. We have 52 regions or so here. And another thing, outliers. Outliers show us that although most regions are following this behavior, we still can see even regions that maintain their classification and have the uh, considerable net negative point influx or, or beta regions that maintain their classifications at beta and saw a tremendous amount of energy being injected. But again, this is only compared with the following day. If we observe in a larger time, it could have been at Rusio, but later on this region evolved to beta gamma delta and then it could change the interpretation of this depending on the time scale that you're looking for. But the time scale that we are considering here are days. And we also did that plot for different time scales. And this was the one that made more sense for us. Because in, you are not going to see a lot of significant changes in the field, except when you're seeing um, an intense event, such as a flare, same here, rapid reconnection. The time scale that the change, change takes place in an active region is off quite a few hours. So this is the one that we judge to be the best result in this case. Uh, okay, but if we do the same analysis, but now group the regions based on their flare activity, then we see quite a more clear picture here. Because here we have the regions that produced up to B-class flares, including regions that produce no flares. And there is a different, now that I see this is flare class, it's not one to be some class. Regions that produced up to C class flares and including C class flares, and regions that produce the strongest M and X class flares. Again, they completely separate M and X. They are quite, there are quite only a handful of regions that produce X class flares in the world uh, cycle 24. And in the, so it made sense to group them together. Otherwise we'd try, be trying to derive a statistic from a single region or a pair of them. But in this case here, we still don't have many. We still have like 12 of them. And only nine of them produced observations that we judge it to be the best that can be. Single regions being filmed with the event taking place in the zone that the, magnetic field measurements are free enough from this ambiguity. So as yes, in the end of the day is a bit of quality over quantity and we opted to use only the best observations we had. Could discuss that if you guys want later. It's much of a choice anyway, it's not choice. Right, so here we see that with flare activity, they scale quite well with the quantity of energy that they are accumulating over the lifetime. There is a clear distinction between the regions that produce the most intensive flex and the ones that didn't produce any effects. And interesting thing here, regions that didn't produce flares had a clear preference for energy, which is the same that we see in the most extreme case here. And there, we don't even see any outlier that show that had a case where most of the energy was accumulated via tangential motions. And the regions that produced up to C-class sphere, they had quite a balanced distribution. But then again, we might try to think on why those two are so similar in energy that's being, in the share of energy that's being injected. But when we are looking at, at active regions that don't produce a flare 
and they can be generally quite small. Some of them are emergent regions. So these regions, they might have just emerged and didn't have time yet to produce a flare. Also, we don't see the whole sun at all times. So when I tell you that I'm tracking the whole lifetime of the region, I probably should have mentioned that later for the sake of my good conscience. We are on tracking about the side of the sun that we see. So after it goes there, it could have been that this region produced an, and that any of these regions produce an X class flare as far as we know. Is that likely? In most cases, no, but it could have been. So, but again, it's already over the last decade, it's already incredible, it's remarkable that we can take, that the ATMI is taking pictures of the sun for a 12 minutes resolution with a few stops that it has to make maintenance. So we have way more data than people with the MDI, for example, have. So, all right. But then there is another thing here that is worth it to mention. Most of these regions, all of these regions actually that produce them in X-class flares, they at some point in their lifetime were issued a beta gamma delta classification. So it's not by coincidence that this looks like the previous histograms that we are profiling per Montreuxson class. But then again, we might think, oh, but what would be a more fair way of showing this energy distribution? And we decided then to group them by flare index, which you sum the number of A, B, C, M, and X class flares it did, but you multiply this sum by a quantity that scales with the flare, which is from 0, 0, 001 to 100. And then you add them up together and then you come up with the flare index. And here we can see again, measuring the same thing, accumulated energy over the lifetime and share of lifetime accumulated energy, that the regions that produce the largest amount of flare activity based on this index, they are, they have most of their energy being injected by emergence. While in the regions that produce less than 10, 50, give or take, uh, no, it's 30 here, yeah. 30 flare index, this energy distribution doesn't seem to follow any rule. And in here, we can see some indications that this could be scaling on time. But again, we see exceptions. And looking closer at these exceptions, this was an, an active region. And this is so exceptional because notice how high it goes in total accumulated energy. And also look at what was the main mechanism of energy injection here, going against all the all, everything we saw there. It was tangential motions. But if you look at this region, if you track it over solar monitor or the sun in time tool, but it's my weapon of choice. You can fast forward after 15 days and you're gonna see the same region coming back. Why do I say the same? Because I cannot tell you with over 99% of accuracy that of it's, I'm just saying that because the region has a very similar shape. It comes in the same latitude 15 days after that one disappears on the side of the sun, which is half solar rotation. So we are going to be seeing the, all the evidence points that the same region got back to us. And then again, how can I go and, and say that this region didn't produce, for example, an X-glass flare, which would, thumb, which would make those regions go a bit here. And also, in here, I'm only considering flare activity that took place after minus 50 degrees of longitude. Why? I don't have data before minus 50 of longitude. I discarded most of this data. So 
I don't have the energy buildup that originated that flare. So if you consider that too, you're gonna see some of those regions nudging to the right-hand side, increasing the likelihood of us seeing a bit more of a spread. But then again, this that I'm telling, that I am just discussing and doing an exercise of assumptions, it's not what we see here. What I'm showing you is what the data is, what the data showed me, the data that I took a lot of care to separate. But I would be very curious to see how our understanding would change if we could actually see this up from all the sides and actually track these regions. And especially now that the ATM might actually finish it capturing a whole solar cycle and we are gonna be able to compare these numbers in five, 10 years time with similar numbers from the new solar cycle. That's, that, that brings me some joy to think on that. Honestly, it's something very interesting to think about. And hopefully I didn't kill anyone of boredom. I wasn't aiming for that. So if someone died, my apologies. Uh, well, to summarize this, as we saw in the first plot, the energy injection is high localized in the active region image space. So obviously the field of view at the harp encompasses more than the region. But even so, compared to the active region size, this is very localized. And visually inspecting, you're going to see that they are located on or around large regions or in the sunspot themselves. Surprise here, no, these are the regions with the largest magnetic fields. So according to the first equation, that's where it should be. Most of the energy is injected by emergence, but what we saw is that this behavior is quite comparable. So it would be, it would be very imprecise to say that emergence is the only quantity that we are we need to be interested in. These tangential motions are, um, are very relevant too, especially because they can twist the tubes and everything that people that do with extrapolators are gonna be able to tell them way better than I can. And the emergence dominance persists across all the maximum intrusion classes, as we saw. Again, the, when we are checking at the evolutions, the interquartile ranges, the box and whisker plots, uh, the box itself, they almost exclusive are above the 50% contribution. And also active regions that are moving downwards, they are gonna see a uh, dominance of the tangential motions as we saw too. And again, statistically, we have the levels of these energy to scale with the ghost flare class, as we saw then in the, we just saw that on that flare index and the other side. So we are gonna have a medium of total energy here for these, now to throw in some numbers. There's almost an entire order of magnitude of difference from the extreme cases and a significant difference on the medium of the C to B class flares. And again, the share of this medium for M in class flares, it's quite, it's a bit higher than we see for the entire set, being 57% more energy being injected by, by emergence motions. So there's a largest energy imbalance. And when we look at the box, they are totally separated. So it's, there is a clear preference. And again, on a case by cases, we saw that sign of correlation is that correlation better or worse than it seems to be? I can't know without having the look of the world sun. And that's me done. Thank you very much, everyone. Hi, Andrea. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk, no? I, I, uh, we have a few questions here, Andrea. The first one is, comes from Abimael. He asked us, how did you analyze the magnetic fields belonging to chromospheric corona? Oh, uh, we, we don't deal with the coronal fields here because if, if you look, the pointing flux, it considers the energy flux going through the circuits. The HMI pixel size, and correct me if I'm this wrong, is, is half an arc second. No, it is half an arc second, which is, if I get it from the top of my mind, 300 and a bit kilometers in size. So considering the resolution that we have, 
in the photosphere is exactly a flat surface that the energy is going through because the photosphere is only a few hundred kilometers thick. So when we look at that, we are seeing the direct energy that's passing through and being injected in the chromosphere and the corona. If you wanna look at those change, changes that is taken on the overlying field, the tool you're looking for is a magnetic field extrapolation, not the photospheric pointing plugs, which is a long way of saying, I didn't do that. <laughs> I, have, I would like to discuss a little bit. Or... I forgot to ask if you would like to, to ask by yourself. Uh, okay. Uh, I see you have used uh, a bit of, of exp uh, magnetic extrapolation, right? No. Is this? You can get the energy with the extrapolations, but they are a different tool. What I never extrapolated the, the above field to integrate it over the volume and obtain the energy. That I didn't do. What I did was measuring the energy that was passing through the photosphere using the photospheric magnetic field and the speed of those magnetic field structures moving over the photosphere. All right, thank you. I, I understood your proceeding. Cool. But it is, it is actually, it would be extremely interesting, in my opinion, to actually do that too, take those same regions, do the magnetic field extrapolation and compare that result. That would be fantastic because then you could see what passes through the photosphere and how that correlates to what is actually building up. I mean, do we have a one pair one correspondence here? I, that would be so exciting to see uh, how, what rate we see, how energy is being dissipated there. And, I think it would lead to all sorts of questions again. And when I build the database, I built it with that in mind already because we can easily extend it with another table, take all those regions and do the magnetic field extrapolations on that. But that's not my problem now, <laughs> to be quite frank. <laughs> Andrea, we, we have also a question from Mariano. Mariano would like to ask by yourself. On the other case, I can ask you. Okay, so I, I you ask. So first of all, Mariano congratulates you, Andrea, for the talk. And he asks a question. Since you have a good database, have you looked for correlations between the flare index or energy injection or, or other parameters such as total magnet flux, mean size of activations, main dipole rotation rate, uh, an estimate of the magnetic helicity would be especially interesting. No? Uh, yes, uh, I've looked at some of these. The helicity, I agree with you, because all you need to calculate helicity is magnetic field and velocity and uh, the vector potential, if I recall correctly. But again, there was only so much I could do. I, I actually had a look on the um, magnetic flux and size and dividing it by sizes. And, but since the results were quite underwhelming, I, just, I didn't include that in here. But in my case, I have more, uh, a bit more results. But again, not the elicity that I didn't look, but size, it seems to be correlated because you have more magnet, more intense magnetic field. And then again, all those beta gamma delta regions, they are much larger than the other ones in the set. And I make those remarks over the work. Uh, I, I forgot to mention that here. Uh, ask you all your forgiveness. But yes, there is this difference in size and it might be the case that, that it's, it's all about size in the end of the day, but also that, those regions that, that they are more complex and larger, they are the ones that are gonna produce a flare. That's a, something that people are treating as a rule of the thumb, but we are trying to look at the caveats of it. Andrea, let me ask you a, a question. As we have um, uh, colleagues that are not used to this technique, could you explain a little bit how you, got, you get the velocity from the observations of the magnetic field? How do you track the the velocity fields, 
Uh, Luiz? Uh, sure. Hi. Uh, 